Welcome to Truth Triumphant Radio. I'm your host, Cody Mori, And today I wanted to discuss something that's popped up quite a bit, uh, not just within the Adventist community, but also within greater Christendom. It's been from the past. It's been in the present. And depending on how long the future is, I'm sure it will crop up again. It seems to be one of those doctrines that just continues to sort of come up and be become quite popular at certain times. Now, uh, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the doctrine that the earth is flat. Yes. I know some of you are thinking, oh no, he's going to talk about that. Yes, yes I am, and, and here's why. Because it's one of those doctrines that regardless of what side you are on on it is is problematic in the sense of it could be a, a great distraction in regards to what we are supposed to be doing w what we are supposed to be doing in these last days god is very clear we are to preach the first second and third angels message the first two are encompassed in the third and we've gone over those messages in depth you know, keep the commandments of God, fear God, the diet, give glory to him. The hour of his judgment has come. The judgment beginning in 1844 and the rediscovery of the sanctuary doctrine, the Sabbath commandment and creation honoring the creator. And then, of course, Babylon has fallen. Not Babylon the Great has fallen, but Babylon has fallen, talking about apostate Protestantism. And then going into the third angel's message, it talks about it talks about not receiving the mark of the beast. What is the beast? The beast is the Roman Catholic Church system, and its mark is, according to them, their mark of authority of ecclesiastical power is the Sunday sacredness doctrine. So... Anything that, that is outside, any doctrine that we have, any belief, it doesn't really matter what we believe. Uh, I just want to say as far as, as, far as uh, some of these other minor issues are concerned, it does matter what we believe on many other issues. But the, this is one of those doctrines that when it comes to specifically doing the work, it actually doesn't really matter what you believe in regards to whether the earth is flat or whether it's a sphere. And the reason is, is because it in no way, shape or form impacts the work that we are supposed to be doing. Now, if it does, if it does impact the work that we are supposed to be doing, then it is a problem. So without further ado, let's let's get into what the spirit of prophecy has to say about this issue. And I'm going to be reading from Gospel Workers, the 1915 edition. And to give us a lot of context, I'm going to read about a page and a half here, which starts in page 312 and finishes in page 314. It says this. Men of ability have devoted a lifetime of study and prayer to the searching of the scriptures, and yet there are many portions of the Bible that have not been fully explored. Some passages of scripture will never be perfectly comprehended until the future life Christ shall explain them. There are mysteries to be unraveled, statements that human minds cannot harmonize, and the enemy will seek to arouse arguments upon these points, which might better remain undiscussed. A devout spiritual worker will avoid bringing up minor theoretical differences and will devote his energies to the proclamation of the great testing truths to be given to the world. Now let's stop there just for a second. Clearly, clearly, the Holy Spirit is saying don't make an issue out of something. That's not an issue. That's why in the process of our discussion today, I am not going to be giving any scientific data on one side or the other as to whether or not the earth is flat or whether it is clearly not flat and the reason for that is is because it 
it it changes the argument into a basically a a debate between these two opposing viewpoints and what the holy spirit's entire view and and of course because my conscience is captive to the testimonies to the word of god this becomes my view as well is that the entire argument is invalid the entire point is moot because it has nothing to do with the great testing truths to be given to the world what are the testing truths to be given to the world keep the commandments of god and the faith of jesus christ and the testimony of jesus right so we have the spirit of prophecy there we have the sabbath commandment there and keeping all the commandments and the faith of Jesus, which is righteousness by faith, that we are able to actually keep the commandments, not through our strength, but through the strength of the Lord and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So those are those are the testing testing truths. Those are the tests for the world. The test for the world is not, do you believe the earth is flat? You should never, ever build any type of evangelism around that on either side of the issue don't if you are if you are some because this this is one of the issues that we've run into and you you find this with so many of these false doctrines um and these side issues and 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 distractions and and i want to be hesitant to say false doctrine but false doctrine in the sense of of people making it gospel let's let, let's put it that way People want to create their own tests, their new truths, new light, and new tests for the world and for the church and say, do you believe in the 2520? Do you believe the earth is flat? Do you believe, you know, this, that, or the other? Do you believe in the feast days? And they make all of these things that if a person believes them on their own is, is relatively harmless. But when they make it a test for other people, that's when it becomes a problem and it really bothers me because we have a great amazing work to be done here on this earth and this you see people that that will say oh i can't believe you just showed a heliocentric earth there or whatever a and you you say to yourself really that's what you're focused on that's what you're studying you're not studying how to overcome sin you're not you're not trying to find books on the National Sunday Law or or like books like Bill Hughes's latest book COVID-19 the rest of the story telling people about where all this stuff is leading it's leading to a Sunday law telling people to keep the Sabbath giving people literature and different information on the real important truths of scripture the first second and third angels messages that's what you're focused on that that's my problem with it and then you have people on the other side of the issue that will, they'll get distracted from the work they're doing to go and address it. Now, what I'm doing right now is I'm addressing that there should be no <laughs> discussion whatsoever. So if someone brings this up to you, just tell them, you know, I, I just don't have time to, to look into this. It changes nothing. If the earth is flat, Jesus is still coming in the clouds right if the earth is not flat jesus is still coming in the clouds if the earth is flat the sabbath is still the seventh day of the week if the earth is not flat the sabbath is still the seventh day of the week you see because if the earth is flat the beast is still the roman catholic system and if the earth is not flat the beast is still the roman catholic system and if the earth is flat the mark of the beast is Sunday worship. And if the earth is not flat, you, can, you catch my drift. You see where I'm going with this? So you can just keep going down the line. I could, I could, I could, could record the rest of this entire podcast just mentioning pivotal doctrines that are testing, that are important, and showing that whether someone believes the earth is flat or doesn't, it changes nothing. And that's the point. So let's continue on with the quote. It says, He will point the people to the work of redemption, the commandments of God, 
the near coming of Christ, and it will be found that in these subjects there is food enough for thought. In time past, there have been presented to me, for my opinion, many non-essential, fanciful theories. Some have advocated the theory that believers should pray with their eyes open. Others teach that because those who ministered anciently in sacred office were required upon entering the sanctuary to remove their sandals and wash their feet, believers now should remove their shoes when entering the house of worship. Still others refer to the sixth commandment and declare that even the insects that torment human beings should not be killed. That's also a Hindu belief as well, just so you know. Continuing on, it says, and some have put forth the theory that the redeemed will not have gray hair. As if this were a matter of any importance, I am instructed to say that these theories are to the, are the production of minds of unlearned in the first principles of the gospel. By such theories, the enemy strives to eclipse the great truths for this time. Let me read that one more time. By such theories, the enemy strives to eclipse the great truths for this time. So, these extra theories, which in no way, shape, or form change our message, and, and yet we spend time discussing them. The Holy Spirit says that, that we are playing right into Satan's hand and we are being distracted, which is exactly what he wants us to do. While there are souls perishing, we are arguing amongst each other over these other theories. And you could throw in whatever whatever theory you would like that is plaguing not only Seventh-day Adventist Church, but throughout the Christian world. Things that don't matter, that people are arguing over. There was an argument um, a few decades ago, and it, it probably has cropped up here and there in different areas, but it was a question as to whether or not Seventh-day Adventists could eat tuna because they didn't have scales but they did actually did have scales when they when they're born they just swim so fast that they they come off and it's and when you you think that that's an that's a point of argument when we have the first second and third angels message to give to a dying world before probation is closed and Jesus comes in the clouds that's what we're that's what we're focused on i think that the holy spirit is is very saddened to see us uh, arguing amongst ourselves um, about such trivial matters. And, and, and at the same time, Satan's on the other side and he's laughing, you know. And that's what this whole issue is. It goes on, it says, Those who in their preaching pass by the great truths of God's word to speak of minor matters are not preaching the gospel but are dealing in idle sophistry. Let not our ministers spend time in the discussion of such matters. Let those who have any questions as to what they should teach, any questions as to the subjects upon which they should dwell, go to the discourses of the great teacher and follow his lines of thought. The subjects that Jesus regarded are essential, as essential are the subjects that we are to urge home today. We are to encourage our hearers to dwell upon those subjects which are of eternal moment. When, at one time, a brother came to me with the message that the world is flat, I was instructed to present the commission that Christ gave his disciples. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. In regard to such subjects as the flat world theory, she calls it a theory there, God says to every soul, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. I have given you your commission. Dwell upon the great testing truths for this time, not upon matters that have no bearing upon our work. So that's exactly the point that I was making earlier. What is that to thee? In other words, what are you talking about? What, is that, what does that mean to you? What does that change? What does that impact? What does that have to do with what we are doing? Nothing. What is that to thee? That's what the Holy Spirit says. Follow thou me instead. That's what Christ is saying to us. And I know, you know what you're going to hear from people that want to make this an issue? First off, they try to they try to force it into 
either the first, second, or third angel's message, of course, which we've gone over, is not possible. Second off, they'll say, yeah, she said that back then, but now, now Christ is almost here and we have to keep unearthing all the, all the truths until all the truth is restored. And the flat earth truth is the, is the truth that we all need to understand before he comes. And, you know, that the Jesuits are behind it and stuff like that. And I, I really think that that whether it's true or not, as far as the Jesuits' involvement in propagating the flat earth theory or, or trying to hide it, whichever side, explaining that to people makes us look silly because anybody can see that that's not an important issue and that it shouldn't be something that we are devoting our time to. And as far as that whole argument that okay but this is for this is for the last days this is not for well you got to think mrs white updated that book gospel workers in 1915 that's the year that she died right she was actually never supposed to die christ was supposed to come the, he could have came in the 1850s i've seen sources to that say from mrs white that he could have came in the 1850s he could have came in the 1880s Mrs. White was originally not supposed to die. She has, she has prophecies that were conditional where she said that there were folks at a place that were not supposed to die. Many people use that as an argument to say that Mrs. White was a false prophet. However, it was because we didn't finish the work that we didn't get to go home. So you can't use that because if, if this testing if you're saying this is a testing truth before right before christ comes and that it wasn't applicable to that day well that all the testing truths that are applicable to christ's coming were there in that moment at that time gospel workers 1915 because christ could have came before then so all the truths that were being sought to be restored had been the salvational truths and that's the issue with the whole thing. This is another article here, or um, source, from Mrs. White. Uh, it's letter 43, 1887. It says this, I hope Brother Wilcox will be a truly converted man. This is his great need at the present time. He wants meekness. He wants humility. He wants genuine piety. And without it, he is a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. His soul and your soul will need the indwelling of Jesus. Whether the world is round or flat will not save a soul. But whether men believe and obey means everything. Wow. Very powerful. Very straight to the point. Again, this is inspiration speaking. Forget about Ellen White. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to us, saying, let me read it again. Whether the world is round or flat will not save a soul. But whether men believe and obey means everything. Believe what and obey what? Believe the gospel and obey the commandments of God. And that's the way in which we're always tested. And you go throughout scripture, there's a there's a hymn that's called Trust and Obey. I it it's it's one of my favorites actually, at least recently. It's it's been one of my favorites. And you think I was thinking about this the other day, trust and obey, trust and obey. That those ways, trust and obedience are the Two only ways in which God tests somebody, uh, like an actual test coming from God. He's always testing people to see if they will trust him or if they will be obedient or both. Like with Abraham, you think about Abraham when he was told to 
slay his son Isaac, except for Isaac was the child of promise. So God was, was telling him to, to destroy his own son, who also was the promised one that he would have a large family and, and, and long posterity, and that his posterity would be as the sand of the sea. So it didn't make any sense. So he had to both trust God that though he it didn't make sense that how God could still fulfill his promise and yet take away the means by which God said originally that he would fulfill that promise, which was through Isaac, and that would he be obedient in in slaying his son as a burnt offering. And of course, Isaac was full grown male at that time. So it was very much just like Jesus Christ's offering, willing father, willing son, uh, in obedience to God. And if you read Patriarchs and Prophets, I really love the thinking of Abraham on this issue. He thought that even though he was going to slay his son, that God could raise him back up from the dead and that the he would have his son back and the all the promises that went along with his with his child of promise there Isaac would be fulfilled still and that's what you see throughout you see with the issue with manna being rained from heaven so often with water the water that came from the rock and so many times where the children of Israel were wandering through the wilderness and their tests were always whether they would trust the Lord and whether they would be obedient to him. Now, the flat earth, or whether the earth is, is a round or a sphere, has absolutely nothing to do with that. And when people, I'm telling you, uh, folks, that when people try to say that it does, ironically then it is then it it is it is salvational you see when people push it upon others and make something that's not salvational salvational then it does become salvational it becomes salvational to them because now and folks if you're somebody who's doing this i would highly highly recommend you stop and, and get back to the scriptures and focus on what's important because you've adopted another gospel. And by adopting another gospel, what does Galatians say about adopting another gospel? This is what the Apostle Paul has to say about accepting another gospel. From Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you and that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So folks, it becomes salvational when we make it salvational. When we say, you have to believe this or else you're not a Christian. Then it does become salvational. But it becomes salvational not for the people that, are, that don't care about your argument. It becomes salvational to you when you make this bigger than what it is. Because... Because it's not the gospel that's in the scriptures. What is the gospel that's in the scriptures? The gospel is that all men have fallen short of the glory of God. But God sent his only begotten son that he should die. That men might be forgiven and accepted before God. And not only that, but have the, uh, uh, the ability, the power to be the sons and daughters of God, to actually overcome sin, to actually be good, to be able to keep the commandments of God, 
to overcome our sins, not just to be forgiven of our sins, but to overcome those sins through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, not in our own power, but through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that's why it's so important. So if you make it a, if you make it a gospel or an addition to the gospel, adding to the gospel, then you're falling under the, the accursed that Paul speaks about in Galatians chapter 1. Now, if you're somebody who has been involved in debate as far as whether or not it's true or not, it's not worth your time. It's just not worth your time. It's not worth your time at all because it's just a distraction, as we saw from the Spirit of Prophecy earlier. Now, I have one more quote here. This is from James White. Remember, James White is not a prophet. He is a man. Therefore, what he says uh, is to be perhaps taken into consideration, but it is not authoritative. Nevertheless, he makes a good point. Uh, and this was written in the Review and Herald, January 28, 1862. He says this, The honest deacon who believes the world flat and immovable may be just as good a Christian as devotional in all his exercises and as godly in his walk as one that believes otherwise. Such a faith or such an error has little or nothing to do with religion or practical godliness, but it neither denies the necessity nor worth of the atonement. But not so with the error that says no spirit. This error strikes at the very root of the matter, and with one fell stroke it crushes down everything before it, leaving man utterly destitute of all goodness. I do not contend against forms, neither do I deny the worth of doctrine. Yet I do say that when we take out the Spirit of God from the religion of the Bible, the rest that remains is not worth speaking about. All right, so a pretty clear and, and a solid point from James White is that somebody who does believe the earth is flat, that it doesn't mean that they're a bad Christian. They can be just as good of a Christian if they believe that. So there's both sides of the issue. And I've tried, I've tried to be very careful as to not necessarily uh, point out which side's accurate and which side's not, because I, I think that's, I think it's fairly obvious, but um, that's not the argument anyway. Just as James White is saying here, I would say I agree with him on this one. It, and, and that's because we've looked at two other Spirit of Prophecy quotes that corroborate this. So obviously James and Ellen had talked and discussed this issue at least at some point. So what James White is saying is that you could still be a good Christian and believe something that is not uh, doctrinally relevant to the first, second, and third angel's messages. So you can have some personal belief, that's fine. But when you start to push it upon others, to publish it and make it make it something that, come, look at this, I have new light, or you need to understand this, or you need to believe this, otherwise you're going to be lost, or you're going to be deceived. No, no. That is when it steps into the realm of a salvational issue. We have the power. We can make anything we want to into a salvational issue by saying it's a salvational issue, especially when it's not. So let's keep the salvational issues sacred and, and make sure that the tests aren't too many. Let's keep the tests the same as what God has kept for his tests, which are the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. I'm Cody Moore, and you've been listening to Truth Triumphant Radio. We'll catch you next time. God bless.